right. This morning, we're going to give the message before we observe the Lord's table. I want to bring a message from 1 Corinthians 11 today on the Lord's table. I'm going to title this message, The Lord's Table, A Place Where We Deepen Our Worship of the Lord Jesus. So we're going to consider this New Testament teaching on the Lord's Table, and then we'll uh, distribute the elements and share the Lord's Table together. A practical theologian named Howard Marshall reflected back on the first time he was able to receive the elements of the Lord's Table. Perhaps you might identify with, uh, with Mr. Marshall's remembrance of his first time receiving the Lord's Table. He said this, I remember the first time I was given the privilege to participate in the Lord's Table. For weeks I had looked forward to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. But this anticipation was restrained when I ate and drank with the other worshipers. I had expected a supernatural influx of divine power, but nothing miraculous happened during the service. I thought about Christ's death on the cross of Calvary, the remission of sins, and the presence of the Lord. In a sense, that first experience for me was sobering, but it was not magical. Any of you remember the first time you took the Lord's table? Maybe you thought it would be something mystical. Maybe you thought you'd feel something. Maybe you thought there would be a, uh, uh, some sort of a magical experience for you the first time you took the Lord's table. There are churches that teach that. There are te- t- churches that teach that the, when, we, when we have and receive the Lord's table, there is an, a, a, a coming of the Holy Spirit that's unique to that time. There are those churches that teach that when you partake the Lord's table, you actually eat the very body and drink the very blood of Jesus in a magical sense. I want to look today at 1 Corinthians 11 to understand because God revealed this so we would know what we're doing when we observe the Lord's table. The book of Corinthians to a church that was heaven some wasn't it? They were not doing very well on several levels. You read the book of 1 Corinthians and you find that, that they, had, they had divisions on theological issues. They had divisions on moral issues. They were arguing over who was the greatest one to follow. Remember uh, chapter 3, some say, well, I follow Paul. You know, I follow Peter. Well, you guys think you got it. I follow Jesus. And there was division in the church over who they thought was the best person to be following. They're, they had a, a member in their church that was living immorally with his stepmother, and they were embracing him, trying to show him grace. They weren't correcting him. They weren't using their spiritual gifts right. Man, Paul really went over spiritual gifts, and in the middle of spiritual gifts, he told them that if you have all the gifts and you don't have love, you don't have anything, because they were misusing the spiritual gifts using them without love. And they came together to observe the Lord's table as a feasting time where the rich ate well and the poor didn't get as much. And instead of being a time of worshiping the Lord Jesus, it was a time of division in the church. So as a a picture of the church throughout the ages, the, the church in Corinth, they lacked unity, They lacked love. They did not come together in the right way, in the right spirit. And so when they came together to observe the Lord's table, Paul said, God is not pleased with your observance of the Lord's table. That's pretty strong language. They were doing something that they thought was uniquely spiritual, and Paul said, God is not even pleased when you come together to observe the Lord's table. What I want us to understand this morning is that believers must understand that when they eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord, they are guests at His table. If you come to our home and you eat with us, 
we are going to give instructions before we eat and here's where you start and here's where you get your food and here's where you can sit it's our table and if I come to your house you may have instructions for me for how to eat at your table well God has instructions for coming to his table because we are guests at his table Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to be spending some time here today looking at references here. Verse 23, Paul writes, For I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep or have died. But if we are more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. What does he call us to? He calls us to remember the Lord's death until he returns for his church. This is a time of remembering the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps if we didn't remember this on a monthly basis, we might only function on Easter Sunday, Good Friday. That might be the one time of the year we really stop and focus, but we're called to remember this on a regular basis. Some churches observe the Lord's table every Sunday. Some observe it quarterly. We choose to observe it monthly. The time is not specifically given. We're just called to remember the Lord's death on a regular basis. It seems that the church in Corinth missed this key point. We don't come to the Lord's table to get more of Jesus. I've had people say to me, oh, I, I have to go to Mass. I need more of Jesus. I've got to take that cup and I've got to get that, get that bread. I've got to ingest. I need more of Jesus. That's, that's not what we're taught here. It's not a time to make up for the sin of the week. Oh, I, boy, we need to have communion. I just got to have the Lord's table. I've just been having some sin trouble, and I just need that spiritual boost. That's not what it's for. Nor is this the moment when the Holy Spirit joins our service. And there are churches that teach that. When we gather around the Lord's table, that's when the Holy Spirit joins the service. That's not what this passage teaches either. For if each of us possess the Holy Spirit as soon as we gather together the Spirit is with us we don't need a special magical moment to invite the Spirit into our service it should be a time of worship of repentance and of proclaiming the gospel today's message is those three points the Lord's table is a place where we deepen our worship of the Lord Jesus. We understand our repentance and we proclaim His message. Father, we pray for Your guidance today. We pray for Your direction. We pray that this message, as we seek to understand what You gave to Paul, will, will give us clarity as we come to the Lord's table this morning and in future observances of this table as well. Open our hearts and minds, open our understandings by your spirit, through your word we pray in your name, amen. At the Lord's table, first of all, we deepen our worship of the Lord Jesus. 
we deepen our worship of the Lord Jesus. Paul said in verse 24, Jesus said, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ wants us to remember the sacrifice of his body, to remember the, 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 the shedding of his blood, to worship him during this time. Look at some references, and this is a very theological point, a, a richly theological point, not a boring point, a rich point. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul wrote that he who knew no sin became our sin. What a great point. He who knew no sin became our sin. Why? So we could become the righteousness of God in him. Isaiah 53, 10, thank you for reading that to us this morning, Ben. It says in that passage, it pleased the Father to crush the Son. Have you given that much thought? The Lord Jesus was crushed for us, for our iniquity. He didn't deserve one of those beatings. He didn't deserve one of the nails. He didn't deserve to have shed one drop of blood on our behalf. And yet Isaiah makes it clear that the Son would be crushed for the sins of those He died to redeem. I'm not a, a doctor. I've read a bit about the crucifixion of Christ and when the nails were driven into the, the, the wrist area, not the hand. Here, it would just pull through the flesh. It had to be back into the wrist area where there's bone structure to hold the body. That to drive a nail through here, it had to crush a key nerve. You ever had nerve pain? Just a small nerve pain. The Lord had nerves crushed in his hands and in his feet as he bore our sin. May we worship him more fully. John 17, 4, we read the Lord Jesus submitted fully to complete the will of the Father. We read the will of the Father in John 3.16, don't we? God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. That was the will of the Father. Christ came to do the will of the Father and completed the will of the Father all the way through the crushing of His human body that our sins might be forgiven. Turn to the book of Hebrews with me. Some of us have been studying the book of Hebrews together. Hebrews calls the Old Covenant faulty. Hebrews chapter 8. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament, it says was faulty. Hebrews 8 verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he, the Lord Jesus, has made the first one obsolete. What is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. How could the Old Testament have been done away? Well, there had to be a new testament or a new covenant. Christ came to fulfill the new covenant for us. He came by living a sinless life, by offering himself as a substitutionary death, so that he then could establish the new covenant. Hebrews 8, verse 6. But in fact, the ministry of Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. You read Isaiah and, 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 and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and some of the other Old Testament prophets, it speaks of a day when their sins will be remembered against them no more. Where sin will be removed as far as the east is from the west. That's looking forward to a future time because not one sin that was atoned for in the temple was, for, was, was removed. They were still there before God. For the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Only the blood of the Savior. Christ came to establish a new covenant and we worship Him because of this. 
But it took the sacrifice of the Lamb of God to take away our sin. To take away the sin of the world before the Father. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. But because Jesus lives forever, He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, He is able to save completely or save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him because He always lives to intercede for them. Oh, as we remember Christ at the Lord's table, let's remember that He came to establish a permanent priesthood from which He could save completely, save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Now, my, my friend, my brother, my sister today, if you ever doubt your salvation, come back to Hebrews 7.25. Or 7, uh, yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, 25. What did Jesus do? He came to save you completely. To save you to the uttermost. That's why he came. If you know you are, have trusted Christ as your Savior, you know He has forgiven you of the sin of your life, before God in heaven, you are saved completely. You are saved to the uttermost. Let's worship Christ for this. No religion offers this. Not one. Every religion says you must do something, and hopefully you'll attain the presence of the deity. Not Christianity. Jesus gave himself so that we could be eternally and completely saved through him. Hebrews 9.15, the author of Hebrews cites Jeremiah 31. That the new covenant is superior to the old covenant and that Christ is the mediator. Hebrews 9 verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. What kind of inheritance? Eternal inheritance. How long is the promise of the Lord Jesus for us? Forever. There's nothing in this life that's forever. Are you aware of that? My sons and I were, were traveling through western U.S. one day, and we were stopped for a very long construction break. And next to us was a truck, flatbed truck, loaded with smashed cars. Each car was about this big. And so the, it was just stacked. The entire truck was stacked with smashed cars. So we had time to look at these cars and realized that one day somebody went into a showroom, a dealership, and paid good money and drove these cars off of a lot. Of course, they weren't smashed then, of course, right? They were shiny and pretty and they had all of the amenities uh, that the person wanted. Maybe some were custom ordered cars, favorite color. And the person that bought that that car brought it home and parked it in their driveway and washed it and kept it clean and showed, off them, showed it off to their friends and family. And they got inside that car and they felt really important in that car. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> it was smashed. It was this big headed to a recycling place somewhere. Do you realize that everything in this earth is tempered like that truckload of cars? Everything. The only thing that we possess that is not temporary is the promise of eternal, an eternal inheritance through the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to realize that the more we study and learn about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, God in flesh, the more we will worship Him. This is what we're called to do. We are called at the Lord's table to worship the Lord Jesus who allowed His human body to be crushed because of our sin. Because of this teaching, the remembrance of Christ and the broken bread and wine should lead us to greater worship every time we stop and partake of the Lord's table which is given to us as an amazing reminder 
you know, I ask you to break the wafer as a, as a symbol of the broken body of Christ. The juice we drink, it's, it, it, it's not great in flavor. It's not supposed to be great in flavor. It's supposed to be very, very bland and dull. It's supposed to remind us that Christ shed his blood for us. His sinless blood for us. As we come to the Lord's table, we deepen our worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we see in the passage, as we come to the Lord's table, we should deepen our confession of sin before we worship the Lord Jesus. This is not a point that we spend a lot of time on, I'm afraid. But Paul makes this very, very clear. Back in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, So then whoever, verse 27, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Have you ever thought about how serious that verse is? Do any of us want to sin against the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. Okay. Verse 28 Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Paul has called the church in Corinth and every church since then to do serious self-examination before partaking of the Lord's table. The church in Corinth had several issues. There was, they had division amongst themselves. They were not, they were not showing love in, in their use of their spiritual gifts. They were allowing immorality in the church. There were people who weren't getting along with one another. And Paul says to them, stop it. Don't come together for the Lord's table until you fix the sin amongst you. Look with me in Matthew chapter 5. This was not a new thought. This was not new revelation, not really. Because in Matthew 5, 23, Jesus taught something quite similar. Matthew 5, 23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. You know, I have to tell you, I don't know how many times I've seen people in church before taking the Lord's table walk over to a brother or sister, ask their forgiveness, reconcile, and then partake of the elements of the table. I do know that church members have arguments with each other that carry for months which means they've taken the Lord's table without reconciling. Do you see how dangerous that is from God's point of view? Jesus himself, speaking of the Old Testament system, said, if you bring a lamb to the temple, and you bring that lamb to the altar, but before you get to the altar, you remember that somebody has something against you. He said, stop it. Put down your lamb. Go take a trip reconcile with that brother or sister, then come back to the temple, pick up your lamb, and make your sacrifice. You say, that'd be inconvenient. That would really take a lot of my time. Why, then everybody would know that I've got a problem with somebody if I came and then left. 
Well, what's more important? Everybody thinking you're okay? Or are you being at peace with God before you make the sacrifice? I think Paul is reflecting the teaching of the Lord Jesus, but now he's saying when you come to the Lord's table, if you have something against somebody else, before you participate at the Lord's table, go and reconcile with your brother or with your sister. Now, let me just put a, an addendum onto this. If someone refuses to reconcile with you, you cannot make them reconcile with you. If you've done your part and you've gone to somebody and they say, no, I will not reconcile with you, I believe you can still come and observe the Lord's table because you have sought to make right with them. But if you cannot reconcile with somebody, I think Paul's teaching is don't participate the Lord's table until you've reconciled. Now I'll tell you what that means. That means this. That means when the, when the elements are passed, you don't take it. That's what it means. Who cares what the person next to you thinks? That's irrelevant. You know your own heart. This is between you and God, not you and the person next to you. Not you and your husband, you and your wife, or you and your parents. This is between you and God. Paul's teaching is very strong here. Look with me at Ephesians 4, where I think he reiterates this. Ephesians 4, verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. How long should we allow there to be a division in the church? Well, Paul says before the sun goes down. <laughs> I think some people take a little longer than that to cool off. Let's say, let's say it happens right before the sun goes down. You might need to wait until the next day to deal with it. But don't wait too long. His point is when you, when you allow offense between you and another, you are giving Satan a place of operation between you. And before you reconcile to that person, the longer you wait, the more thoughts of bitterness you have, the more false thoughts you have about that person. Because you don't reconcile quickly. My parents drilled this into us as children. My mother wouldn't let us take another step until we resolved something with our brothers, my brother or sister, or with them. We got married, and I didn't like going to sleep if there was something between us. I remember times lying in bed and thinking, God, I don't want to deal with this. But this verse, don't let the sun go down upon your anger. Settle it. Don't wake up in anger. Settle it. So I take a deep breath and get out of bed and go find my wife and say, Hon, we've got to talk about this. this. There's something between us. You know what I learned over the years? If you go to bed at peace and you wake up at peace, you're never going to have thoughts of divorce. You go to bed in peace, you wake up at peace, You'll never have thoughts of divorce. Your kids won't wonder if you're okay. You won't go to work and say awful things about each other. Because you went to bed at peace and you woke up at peace. But suppose our church family, every time we gathered, we left in peace. Maybe there was something friction when we came, but we settled it. And we never went home from church with friction between a brother or sister. Or you didn't want to come to church and with friction, and so you called that person the night before and said, we got to talk. I can't, I can't go to church tomorrow and knowing I'm not at peace with you. I want to come to church and be at peace, and tomorrow is Lord's table. And I, don't, I don't want to have to think about the Lord's table and, and, and not participating because you and I don't have peace within, between us. Is this a serious point? You think I'm making too much of this? If you do see me afterwards, and we'll have an argument. I mean, we'll have a discussion. <laughs> this, this, this is the, 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 the teaching 
of the Word of God. The Corinthian church had used the Lord's table as a place to show favoritism. And Paul said, essentially, he said, stop it. Stop it. In 1 Corinthians 11, we back up to verse 17. And he says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. He's correcting their misuse of the Lord's table. I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Imagine, when you gather at the Lord's table, he said you are doing more harm than good. What a rebuke. What a rebuke. And for those of us that don't like to be corrected, if you read the New Testament, correction is part of discipleship. We need to be corrected now and then. This is a very strong correction. Because remember, it's not our table. It's the Lord's table. We are guests at His table. And He has some very specific directions for us. When we come to the Lord's table, may we deepen our confession of sin before we worship the Lord Jesus. And the third point in this passage I find in verse 26. We deepen our love for the Lord Jesus so that we will lead others to worship Him. The Lord wants us to remember His death until He comes, and He wants us to proclaim it until He comes. Look at verse 26 again. For when, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Now, what's it mean to proclaim? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. To proclaim the Lord's death is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look in 1 Corinthians 9 with me. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Verse 16, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. Same word. The word proclaim in 1 Corinthians 11, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, is the same word Paul uses here. And we can go over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 18. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Same word as we find in 1 Corinthians 11. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So what is this word? The Greek word is the word katangelo. The word katangelo, it, it, it simply means to, to um, pro announce, to proclaim, or to declare. When we observe the Lord's table, worshiping the Lord Jesus, confessing sin, unifying each other around this table, we preach to the world that Jesus is God that He is Lord, that He has died for our sin, that His blood will forgive them as well. In Acts 5.42, it says, The apostles did not stop teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And here, this word of preach is the word euangelizo, same root as katangelo, euangelizo, and it literally means to tell the good news. To tell the good news. I once knew a man who was a phenomenal furniture maker. And I spent some time working with him trying to learn a little bit about furniture making. He was amazing. He could explain everything he did with great clarity. He loved to talk about putting furniture together. But he said to me, I'm just not able to share my faith with anybody. I kind of scratched my head. I said, you have no trouble talking about making furniture. What do you mean you can't tell people about Jesus? Which is better news, how to make furniture or the Lord Jesus? Well, of course, Jesus is far better news. 
than anything else we talk about. And as far as I know, none of us have trouble talking. We're all pretty good at it. When we gather at the Lord's table, we proclaim, we tell the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants us to proclaim it until his return. That's the end time. Okay? Now, as we think about this, the, Lord, the Lord's table, this is unique to Bible Christianity, where we come as a remembrance. Like I said, we don't get more of the Holy Spirit. We don't digest more of Jesus. We come to remember what he did. This is unique to Bible Christianity. There's no superstition. There's no mysticism. There's no magic when we take the Lord's table. It is a remembrance. And so when we tell others of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus, we want, them to, we want to let them know that we worship Him because He freely gave Himself to us. He freely gave Himself to us. If someone can talk to you about anything, we should be able to tell them about the Lord Jesus. He, he completed the work of our salvation. There's nothing else we need to do. You know how encouraging this is to people? To be able to tell somebody, you know, we believe that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin. What do you do with your sin? We believe that Jesus came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world so we can stand before God eternally washed in the blood of Jesus. What do you do with your sin? That's a great conversation to have with people. That's good news. Because what they believe is not good news. And by the way, proclaiming the good news is active. It's not passive. Oh, they'll just watch my life and believe. Maybe. That's not what the Bible teaches. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If they don't hear, how can they believe? We are the proclaimers. We are the ones who can tell the good news. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you don't, don't consider yourself to be a preacher. Sorry, Pastor, I'm not a preacher. If I asked most of you to give a sermon in church, you'd go, whew, I don't know if I could ever do that. That's beyond my understanding. Great. It gives me job security, right? But every one of you are to be proclaimers of the good news. What is the good news? Can I tell you what Jesus did for me? On Sunday, we observed the Lord's table. We have a little wafer, and we have a little thing of juice, and the little wafer represents the body of Christ. The little juice represents the blood of Christ. And we, 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 we gather together to worship Jesus because he broke his body and shed his blood so our sin could be forgiven. I'm pretty sure every one of you could say that paragraph. That's proclaiming. Remembering the work of Christ. Now, this command to proclaim, I want you to think about with me for a minute. It has both a backward and a forward look. A backward look, we look, we look backward to the cross. As a forward look, we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We worship the Lord Jesus for His sinless sacrifice, and we anticipate worshiping Him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right? Turn to Revelation chapter 19. This is what the Lord's table looks forward to. Revelation 19 and verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and the sound of peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready fine linen bright and clean was given her to wear fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people there's coming a dinner after that dinner we won't have the Lord's table anymore because we'll be in his presence 
That will be the culmination of all the gatherings of the Lord's table down through history when we gather together with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We look forward to a, a, a better place one day, but shouldn't church be a better place today? Can you imagine if every time we gather around the Lord's table, we gather to worship Christ, we gather with confessed sin and unity, reconciled to every person in the room, and we proclaim the death and the resurrection of Christ together. This is the new covenant. We drink the juice, we break the bread to remember the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our iniquity. By his stripes we are healed. He took our judgment upon himself so we could be set free and enjoy the presence of God for eternity. This is the new covenant, not the old covenant. The new covenant goes to, goes to, to Calvary. The old covenant went to Jerusalem. The sin of Jeroboam was he put up altars outside Jerusalem. You had to go to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice. That's the old covenant. The new covenant is we go to Calvary. We go to Calvary. So what's the new covenant? The new covenant requires that we visit the cross of the Lord Jesus, which we can do from any place in the world. Do we have to have a religious holiday? Do we need to make a trip to Jerusalem? We have to go to Bethlehem and see the birthplace. We have to go to Jerusalem and see the, 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 the skull of the cross. Do we have to do all that to find salvation? No. From any place in the world, we go to the cross of Christ in our hearts and our minds. Having been to the cross of the Lord Jesus, having found eternal salvation there, we come to the Lord's table. And we come to the Lord's table to deepen our continued worship of our Savior, proclaiming, his saving work until his return. The Lord's table is a place of deepening worship of the Lord Jesus as we reflect on what he did to bring us to the Father. We confess our sins, we reconcile with one another, and we proclaim the good news of salvation. We do all this to a world that's desperate. They're so lost. They need Jesus so bad. And we're called to proclaim that through this table until he comes. Father, I pray you'd guide us in these thoughts today. Thank you for the clarity of Scripture. We ask you, Lord, today, we might take this clarity and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. And Lord, before we come to the table today, we want to take a moment to examine our own hearts. Lord, if we're harboring sin, we want to confess that sin to you today. If we have habits of the flesh that we're struggling with, we confess those habits to you today. We ask you for the strength to turn from those habits of the flesh, that our bodies might be your holy temple. Lord, if there are relationships that have been severed by sin, we pray you'd lead us to reconcile and then to come to the Lord's table with your blessing and with joy. Lord, may you guide this time. May we worship you today through the breaking of the bread and through the cup. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray.